Okay, I was asked by someone online to, actually by two people online, to make some videos about chain, different chains that I make. So I thought what I would do is start off with one of the more complicated ones. Um, I'm sure if I show everybody how to do this, you're all going to start making them. Just kidding. And I'd kind of discuss how I uh, came up with this method and um, kind of go from there. First off, let me say that for those of you that don't um, know about chain making, there's a lot of books you can get. One of them being, um, probably the, one of the best ones is uh, this one. Let's see if I can zoom out so you can see it. The Textile Techniques in Metal. Um, it doesn't really have anything specific to chain making, but there's a lot of really great techniques in here on uh, weaving different types of metal. So it's a good book. There's like three or four different versions. I have two of the versions, um, but this is a great book. There's also a actual chain making book, which I had sitting here and I can't see it. Here it is right here. This one's really good on um, classic, it's really dusty. <laughs> um, classic loop and loop chains, my cover kind of messed up. It kind of ripped out of the inside. But this one actually goes through um, in depth kind of, sorry, my light is here in the way. Um, things on how to weave uh, different types of chains and stuff. This is a great book. Um, my battery's getting ready to die, hold on. All right, I apologize, my battery died. Um, I have two batteries though, so fortunately the other one was charged. Anyway, this book, um, Classical Loop in Loop Chains and Their Derivatives by Gene Stark and Josephine Smith. You can see right there. Um, this is a good chain to get you, or I'm sorry, this is a good book to get you started. It kind of talks about different kinds of um, Byzantine chains, any kind of chains that would require jump rings. It kind of runs you through um, how much metal you're going to need for each type of chain, and they did a really good job of, of kind of like talking about how to anneal the wire and all that kind of stuff that you'd need to know before you were getting ready to make your own loops and that kind of thing. I'm going to kind of talk about this here in a second about with one type of chain that I make. But um, basically what I'm going to talk about right now um, deals more with, and I'm going to try to sit here and do this. I don't know if this is going to work or not. You guys may see my horribly um, disgusting green pants. <laughs> anyway, um, I learned how to do this from Susan Wood Onstead, who um, unfortunately is no longer with us, but she used to teach at the Mendocino Art Center and at um, the CCAC in San Francisco, which is not called CCAC anymore, and I apologize because I, off the top of my head, I can't think of what it's called. And my friend Amy's going to school there, and I'm, that's horrible, but <laughs> um, anyway, I took two uh, workshops from her eons ago, like in 99, 98, and she basically taught me how to do this. Um, I, I, the first time I took a class from her, I did not actually take the, the wire weaving class, and I came back the following year and then took the class on weaving, just so I could learn how to do this. Um, someone asked me why I choose to weave my own chains, and I think it's because if I'm going to spend you know, X amount of hours making a pendant that is a one-of-a-kind object, I really don't really, I, I don't really want to put it on a pre-made chain. Now, that being said, you can find, and I have some examples in here, you can find chains that look like they've been hand-woven. Um, those of us that make chain will probably know it's not hand-woven, but if you kind of end up using these styles of chains for your work, people kind of get used to seeing them, and you can sometimes get away with using pre-made chain um, to give you this look. I, uh, these are just some pieces that I pulled out, and I'll, I'll kind of zoom in on them so you can see them, but um, I don't know. It's just something I enjoy doing. You can sit in front of the TV and do this. It's not that hard. Uh, the the loop and loop, single loop and loop chain that I'm going to show up here is, um, it's a little more difficult. You have to fuse, you have to fuse lots of little tiny links. And I am going to make a separate video on that because um, Delena, um, the awesome knife maker, uh, wanted me to do a quick video on that as well. It's, it's, it's easy to do those. I just haven't sat down and done it and it's hot outside. And I have to do it outside because it requires heat. But I, I might be able to do it up here. I'll, I'll try to figure out a way to do it. 
Um, it just requires that you fuse some links. But anyway, so I thought what I would focus on today would be these um, chains that a lot of people think are Byzantine or loop and loop chains. And they're actually, I would consider them more a woven type Viking chain, which basically just means that, um, or the way I understand it to mean, you know, everybody has a different interpretation, is that it's a continuous piece of wire that has been wrapped around and woven up into a long cord and then you draw it down and you smooth it out and it makes this kind of chain. Um, there's different ways to do this. I've seen people do it in, in jigs where they, they crochet around an edge and then they pull that down and it makes things. This is just the way I was taught this. Susan taught me how to do this. Um, and this is what I use for my work. Uh, I don't make them all the time. I have a few in here and I'll open this in a second. But um, anyway, so what tools do you need? Well, I, I kind of at least have a pair of flat nose, some type of flat nose pliers. Um, no serration. I don't use anything with serrated edges. Uh, and then I have a pair of just regular chain nose pliers that are really tiny and they have kind of a rounded end. I don't use these that often, but sometimes you might have to get into a loop and fix a loop and this is a good type of um, tool to have. I have a pair of solder snips and you're like, what do you use those for? I use this to cut the wire. You could use scissors. The wire that we're getting ready to use is not really that hard to cut with scissors, so you could just use a good pair of scissors, but these are made to cut through metal, so I just use these. Um, you can get away with weaving these, and I'm moving back and forth because I'm on a pick. My chair has rollers on it. Um, you can get away with weaving these chains around a scribe. But the problem with using like a scribe like this is that the, the metal here is um, too tapered, okay? And it, that would be almost impossible to wrap, wrap your wire around and get every loop being exactly the same size. So what I've done is I have taken um, just a simple pin vise. You can kind of see that. Um, and it holds, you know, up to, I guess, a fourth inch piece of, or eighth inch piece of metal, I'm not really sure. But I actually took a piece of steel, and I'm gonna stand up to show you this because I want you to see this, and I wanna make sure that I'm showing this correctly. Um, this is a piece of steel that I have, if you can see that, I have ground down to a really precise point. But about a fourth of an inch back, it's all the same size. So it's good to use to open loops, but then the chain down here, when you wrap your loops around that, they all become exactly the same size. So I put this inside a little pin vise, if I can get it back in here. Don't put it in too far. And I use this to weave my chain, okay? Um, that, you, I, I, I'm off-handedly said I used brass. I've used brass with these. I've used bronze. This is just a piece of like, uh, I probably got this at like Ace Hardware. I think it's just carbon steel. It's nothing fancy. You could do it out of stainless steel. If you're a bead maker, I'm sure you have stainless bead mandrels. You could use those as well. Anything that you can, um, file down here and polish off. I polished all this off with like a, with just um, Fabuluster. So it's shiny, but it doesn't really necessarily need to be super shiny. So that's the weaving tool. So um, I was told when I first started doing this that you want to use fine silver. And the first chain I made was fine silver. This chain, as you're weaving it, is done in sections. And I brought a little section here to show you. Um, right here. This is a piece of one that kind of messed up, and I, but I kept it because it's nice to have as a, as a scrap. Um, they're usually, depending on how much wire you cut each time, you end up with about an inch of material, and then you usually have like this little piece left over. Can you kind of see that? You have this little piece left over that then you attach the next piece of wire to and you keep weaving. So these chains are basically woven in like one inch increments. That's about how I've worked it out. Um, and so what happens is every inch you have a splice down inside, okay? Um, you can cut it really close. You can have a little splice. Mary Lee Hu, my teacher in graduate school, she does gold chains and she told me that if she ever did gold ones this way, she would never splice them. She would actually probably take the wires at this gauge and probably go in and fuse them together or solder them together so there's no 
wasting of material. Silver's not, you know, that expensive. You can leave a little bit in there. It doesn't really cause that much of a problem. Um, I do not use fine silver because if you're not careful, um, and this is kind of hard to avoid, once you're done and you pull these things down through a draw plate, those little sections of wire show up through the fine silver because the fine silver is so soft that when you kind of manipulate it and get it back into a, a point where it can be used as a chain, the little lumps, the little um, segments that were inside, hidden inside, kind of show up. That's something that I do not like. A lot of other people may be happy using fine silver. Great. You can do that. Try it. Um, I have better success with sterling silver. And I'm going to, as soon as I trade in all my scrap metal, I'm going to buy 100 feet of argentium and I'm going to try to weave one out of argentium because I want to see if it weaves any differently. I think it's going to be a good combination of sterling silver and fine silver um, and I think it'll, and then it won't tarnish. So I think that would be really great. These chains do tarnish kind of easily. So anyway, so I'm going to take my hand away now. You don't need to look at that. So the only other thing you need to think about, um, uh, gauge wise, I use 22 and 24 gauge silver. It will focus on that. Camera's a little slow. Just Rio regular wire. This is the number that I get from them. This is the 24 gauge. I don't know if I'm going to do 24 or 22. I have a thing of 22 back there as well. Um, I have done 20 gauge. That's what this one is made out of. Um, I don't suggest it. It was a nightmare. It's so, sterling is so stiff that it was really hard to make this thing look precise. Anyway, I had to, I ended up having to cut this chain into pieces, make caps for it. And I'm this is a piece that I was going to enter in the Saul Bell design competition. Here, I'll give you a sneak peek of it in pieces in a box. <laughs> so there, I've got lots of segments of that, but it was so hard to weave that I probably won't ever weave another chain like that. Um, anyway, so that's, that's that. What I would like to talk about briefly, really quickly before we start, is there are two different types of, and you can see this chain has kind of already um, darkened, okay? It's kind of hard to see this in here. This is a single loop chain. Now what I mean by that will make more sense when I start to weave one. This means that every time I go around and loop a course, by course I just mean one full completion going around, um, I then go to the next loop that I've created and I discontinue on. A double loop chain, let's see if I can hold these two up at the same time. A double loop chain I don't know if you can see the difference. I'll put them right next to each other. It's kind of hard to tell. This is a single loop chain, and that's a double loop chain. You can kind of see the difference. The single loop chain makes a looser weave, and the double loop chain looks more like a traditional, not Byzantine chain, but it looks like more like a traditional chain. I prefer the double loop chain um, for what I'm making. I think it looks more industrial. This looks more... Um, I don't know, this looks more handmade, kind of, you know, knitted. And I think that has its purp I think this has its purposes. But I usually use these for these, you know, these kind of like weird pieces that I'm making. This is just, I'll hold this up so you can kind of see how I ended it off. So that's just a double loop chain woven. And then I got these, I usually, usually always make the end caps, but Rio had these really cool end caps on sale and I wanted to try using them and they were the right size for the chain, so I bought them and soldered it on, and then I made my own hooks and my own rings. So everything on this is made by me, except for those little end caps, but I don't think you can really tell, so um, that's kind of how I did that. Anyway, so double loop chain. So this is what I'm gonna show you how to do. You start off every chain by making a single loop chain. So I think this will make sense as I'm weaving it, um, and you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna move some of the tools out of the way, and I'm gonna zoom in on this area so you can watch me work. So I'm gonna pause this and there'll be a little jump and then I'm gonna zoom in. <laughs> 